Good morning. So good to have you all here. So good to be healthy. And we're back in the book of Romans as we go through Paul's epistle, essentially, of Jesus Christ. We've gone through some heavy doctrinal issues. And today we're going to take the second half of chapter 13, which um, I trust will be interesting. Just to remind you where we've been, the first three chapters of Romans, basically, Paul takes every single person on the face of the planet, whether they're some immoral person, some heathen that's never heard about Jesus Christ, or whether they're some moralist who has a list of rights and wrongs that they try to hold up to, you know, doing the right thing and not doing the wrong thing. Of course, they fail. Amen? I, I hear you. And the Jews who had the law, who had the prophets, who had the prophecies, all of that, and yet they too could not keep the law. And so what ends up happening is God does for us what the law could never do, and he sent his son to die for our sins to give us power over sin so that we don't have the shame of sin, the guilt of sin, and eventually the presence of sin will be done away with in our lives. So we've been through that, justification by faith in chapter 4. Chapter 5 is Adam and Christ and the comparisons and contrasts. And today we're going to be in chapter 13. This next section begins with chapter 12 and basically goes on to explain what it is to be a living sacrifice. Chapter 12 begins with, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. A, a dead sacrifice is easy because it's a once and done, you know, like, like, like Donald Duck can, you know, he plays a concert and he can only do it once because he dies at the end. But a living sacrifice is a daily moment by moment thing where you die to yourself and you live to the Lord. And if we're told that this is a living sacrifice is holy and acceptable to God, which is our reasonable service of worship, which is our reasonable response to what God has done in our lives. And then we're cautioned not to be conformed to the pattern of this world, not to be pressed into the mold of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we truly need a brainwashing so that we might prove what the will of God is, his good and his pleasing and his perfect will. So we got the good, better, best of, of what God would have us do. So we went through chapter 12 and basically from 12 on explains what it is to live a Christian life. And it's the practical rubber meets the road section. If you remember in chapter 13, which we went over last week, verses one to seven, Bad news. It says, let every soul be subject to governing authorities. So there's no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to those who do good works, but to do evil. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? I, I still haven't gotten that. Every time I see a cop car, I slow down way under the speed limit. It's probably a guilty conscience from my past, but do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good, and you'll have praise from the same, for he is God's minister, rather interesting word he uses, to do to you for good. Yeah, the, the, the minister of God, the police officer that stops me, he's the guy who's keeping me from speeding. That's a good thing. I won't die as quick. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. We talked what the sword is for. It's for lopping off your head in Rome. In the context of this, they didn't bear the sword in vain. What they did with the sword was if they want to take your head off, if you did something, they took it off, and they had the right to do it. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. By the way, that's the purpose of government. It's to punish those who are evildoers and to reward those who do well. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. You do it because the Lord would have you do it. You don't do it just because you're going to get a ticket and you have to pay lots of money and go to court and be humiliated. You do it because you're doing it for the Lord, right? For because of this, you also pay taxes. There's the bad news. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing, especially the IRS. They're constantly pursuing people for money. 
Render, therefore, to all that is due, taxes to whom are taxes due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, and honor to whom honor. So as we go on in chapter 13, we remember the context of where we've been. And Romans 13.10 tells us this, love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. It's simple. Jesus was asked what the greatest commandments were, and he boiled it down to two. You could boil it down to one word, love. It's love God with everything you have. And love your neighbor in the way you love yourself. Well, some of you don't love yourself real well, so you're off the hook. But some of you love yourselves very, very well, and the bar has been raised considerably. You all look fairly clean, well-fed, well-groomed, well-dressed, comfortable, in a comfortable seat. Do you wish that for everybody else around you? And so... That's what it is to show love, and it's the fulfillment of the law. And he goes on to explain it here in chapter 13. This is the chunk that we're going to take today. Owe no one anything. How many of you have a mortgage? Okay, you feeling convicted? Don't worry, we'll talk about it. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, knowing the time, and that now is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. And let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. So let's see if we can take that apart a little bit at a time. So owe no one anything. Well, some people believe that this passage is talking about having a loan, like a car loan or a, or a house loan or anything of that nature. But what it's really talking about is what it spoke of previously in the previous verses, which is taxes. Make sure you don't owe any taxes because those guys have a sword and they might just take you, you know, take your head off. So in the context, he's talking about that, but it's a good idea not to owe people money, right? The scriptures are not against borrowing, by the way. In fact, Jesus said in chapter five of Matthew, if someone wants to borrow from you, don't turn them away. It says, give them what they, what they ask for. Um, but it also says that the borrower is the servant of the lender. You become the slave of the person you've lent to. You know what it is when somebody does you a favor and lends you some money. Sometimes it has strings attached. They bring it up to you all the time. Well, I did loan you that money. Or I did, you know, I did do this cool thing for you. Don't you love that? That's why I hate to borrow anything. Because I hate people to say those things. Well, you know, I remember two weeks, seven days, and five hours, 13 minutes ago, I loaned you this thing. That kind of bites, doesn't it? Because it's not really with the right heart that God would have us give. You owe me one. You ever, you ever heard that? You owe me one. I did you a solid, man. I, you owe me. I owe you one. Okay, let me write you an I owe you. I owe you one. It's interesting. If you watch The Office, there's an episode of The Office where Dwight brings in fresh bagels and he, he offers everyone fresh bagels out of the kindness of his heart, of course. But then he says, you owe me one. <laughs> and the strings are attached. The scripture says that we should owe no one. And so it's a good idea when people come bearing gifts that you want to understand what's in the fine print and what's in the, in the small print that you're getting yourself into. And so you want to be careful. Like the Godfather, you know. 
One day I will ask you for a favor and you will not refuse me. So you have to be careful when you borrow from someone or when you take a favor from somebody because you may have to pay it back at a time in which he will call for you and then <laughs> you cannot refuse. So it's, it's bad news. So be careful what you borrow. And when the scripture says don't owe anybody anything, it means talking about taxes or if you have anything that's back ordered like that because people will find you and they give themselves continually to finding you. But it's an interesting thing when we think somebody owes us. You know, we have a real spirit in this country of uh, entitlement, you know, and you can see it almost on someone's face. You know, Pastor, I walked in here and I was here 4.2 seconds before you said hello to me. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I was kind of busy. I was doing stuff. Can you forgive me? It's like you owe them. It's like you owe them. You don't know anybody like that. I'm glad. Uh, and if we're not careful, we can think that people owe us. And we can get this sort of expectant spirit that people are, you know, that you're the center of the universe and everyone revolves around you. And you know that's not the case, right? God is the center of the universe and we all revolve around him. Amen? Amen. I remember a statement in the scripture in chapter 18 of Matthew, verse 28. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what you owe. You guys remember what story that was? It was the story of the unforgiving servant that Jesus told about a servant who owed 10,000 talents who came to the king because the king said, get him here. And the king said, listen, I, you, you need to pay me what you owe. And he says, well, be patient with me. I'll pay you all. And the king took pity on him and canceled the debt. He didn't just extend the loan. He canceled it at 10,000 talents. It's millions of dollars. And he just forgave it. And then that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants that owed him a couple dollars for a coffee at Starbucks. And he laid hands on him, not in a nice way, not in a healing way, but in a choking way, and said, pay me what you owe me which was a much meaner way than the king told him. And the guy said, be patient with me and I'll pay you all. Same exact words. And he would not. And he took him and he put him in debtor's prison until he could pay it all. You know how much you make in prison? This big zero. You make nothing. So basically, he wanted him to suffer. That's what it is when we don't forgive people. And we put our hands on their throat, at least spiritually. We say, you owe me. Do yourself a favor. Pre-forgive everybody. It's a good way to be. Somebody borrows something from you and you don't see it again? Pre-forgive them. Let it go. Why, why would you carry that? It's not worth it. Romans 13, verse 9. For the commandments... You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there's any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You guys recognize those commandments, right? That's the, what, some of the big 10 that are in there. It's about how we treat one another. And there again, it sums up by saying, show love. And by the way, you know what kind of love that is? That's agape. That's the original word, agapeo. It means unconditional love, where you show love and you don't look for anything in return. You make a decision to show love towards somebody, and you give it without looking for something back. And that's what real love is. It's a gift. It's not something that you look for a return, you know, like a Christmas card. Oh, somebody wrote me a Christmas card. I've got to write them a Christmas card. It's not a, a, a pro quo thing. So... Adultery, it's an interesting word. It has adulterate in it, so it can't be too bad, right? We don't use that word anymore because it kind of stings when you talk about it. Adultery is one of those things that begins in the mind. It begins with a heart that's not satisfied. It begins with somebody who's looking for something that isn't theirs and wasn't given to them. 
And so what ends up happening is you get the roving eye, and then pretty soon it turns into a, a, a tryst. It turns into something much different than God ever intended relationships to be. And it's very popular. <laughs> Some of the top executives of our country have done it. And it's one of those things where the science of psychology says, I guess if you can't fight it, you join them. By the way, adultery is good for your marriage. Did you know that? They have professionals that will tell you this. Adultery is good for your marriage. No. Most, most people that commit adultery end up in divorce. And that's just the simple fact of it. And the fact of the matter is, usually satisfaction in the second and third marriages end up going down sharply. And they tend to end sooner. If you don't found it upon the rock of Jesus Christ, you're done. And so it starts with a heart that's just dissatisfied and looks around for something else other than what you have. And what you have chosen for yourself, by the way, God's plan from the beginning is one man and one woman for life. Right? Just say right. Just agree with me. Have you met my wife? She's my first wife. None of you get it anyway. <laughs> and it's one of those things that can occur very innocently just with some texts back and forth and people in pleasantries and then it becomes flirting and then it becomes something else. Men, I'll tell you, steer clear of it and make sure you have clean hands. Because if your wife is like mine, she'll kill you. <laughs> Not just for wrath, but for conscience sake as well, as the scripture says. Murder. By the way, these are the face of all mass murders in 2019. Mass murders in 2019. It's a rather interesting thing. The ones that you usually hear reported on are usually people with three names, and they're usually Caucasian like me. I just don't know why. And yet these are the faces of everyone in 2019 that committed mass murder. So if you see any of them, you know, they're releasing people out of prisons very, very early now. So you just, uh, I'm sure you'll memorize that page. Anyway, you may have seen this woman in the news recently. She actually murdered her three children. She was emotionally imbalanced and she was upset and her husband was trying to help her get help and the government did not respond and did not run into help and she went off and killed her three children carjacked a pickup truck, drove 200 miles away before they caught her. This is this week's news. She was not considering her children at all. She was not considering her husband at all. She was not considering her parents, her husband's parents. She was not even considering her own life when she did this because there's nobody happy. There is no love in that. By the way, here's your uh, top mass murderers over here on the left-hand side. All of them socialists. Just thought I'd let you know <laughs> the direction of our government ha happens to be heading that way. Mao Zedong, 75 million people. Leopold II of Belgium. You have Hitler with only 17 million. So it doesn't seem that big when you put him next to Stalin. He's at 23 million, or, or, or Mao Zedong, which is 75 million of his own people, of their own people. You're just not thinking about the future when you kill your own people. You're just not. And certainly there is no love. And people who are leaders like that, that don't have a love for their own people and will annihilate anybody who stands up against them, they're going to go down in history on a, on a board like this one right here. Usually anger begins and it gets seething and it becomes overwhelming and then you just want to make the other person hurt. I, I say this from experience. And so you don't think when you get to that place. So guess what? It's a good idea not to go there. <laughs> if you feel your temper rising, your face you know, getting red and you're all upset about something, you better go find a closet and get on your knees. 
because there's no telling what will happen. By the way, the book of Romans was written to Christians. It's a caution because even Christians can do big mistakes, can't they? If you're not surrendered and if you're not daily giving your life to Jesus Christ and asking God for guidance and submitting your emotions, your will, your thoughts to him, you can end up in this category. Murder. Steal. By the way, it's number eight. I put number eight up there. It's the eighth commandment so that you remember it. Stealing. Stealing's an interesting one, right? How many of you have ever stolen? Good. So it's a popular one. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm glad you came today. 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, and idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves. That popular thing is right in there. Nor covetous, which means, oh, I wish, I wish, oh, I wish I had that, I wish. Nor drunkards, nor revilers, which are people that just look for fault in other people and criticize. Nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's kind of heavy. And stealing's right in there. Just so you know, it's talking about those who habitually have a lifestyle of doing this thing. It's not having, like the rest of you, raised your hand and confessed that you, you stole something. It's, it's not that. It's if it's a habitual lifestyle. You're, you're, you don't know him if that's the case. You need to. So, stop the steal. Thou shalt not steal. Don't steal. Here's an interesting thing. Stealing is borrowing forever. So if any of you have borrowed and said you would return it and you haven't returned it, that's stealing because you're borrowing it forever, right? You guys are very quiet. <laughs> Wasting. You know, if you, if you take something and you throw it away, you are taking it away from someone else. Isn't that interesting? That's why hoarding is the sin of stealing. Because you're not sending that thing onto its righteous place where somebody else can use it and actually have some use out of it. Or let it go to its final destination and become, you know, mulch in the ground. Hoarding is stealing. Because you got way more than you'll ever use. And you don't need it. So why are you holding on to it? You're keeping it from somebody else who could use it. So hoarding is stealing. Damaging someone's reputation. You know, you can steal someone's reputation just by some unkind words to someone about someone. Like, did you see so-and-so was in church today? Watch out. Watch out for that Pastor Dave. You can steal a reputation. You can even rob God. It says in Malachi 3, 8 to 10. You know, taking anything that belongs to God and acquiring it for yourself or acquiring it for some other purpose or wasting it is stealing. So it's a much bigger category than maybe you knew, right? Just pretend I said something important. Okay. <laughs> Ephesians 4.28 gives us the antidote. Let him who, steal, who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. The opposite of stealing is giving. Out of maybe things that you need even, giving. You see, that's the opposite of stealing. Instead of hoarding and keeping and taking things you don't need, it's giving away something that maybe you do need out of your essentials. Makes me go, hmm. Bearing false witness. You know what bearing false witness is, right? Everybody knows that's lying. That's when you say that I will tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, and you put your hand on the Bible, which makes it magical. <laughs> Sorry, my mind goes so many places. Speaking falsely in any manner to deceive our neighbor. And you know who your neighbor is? Anybody you happen to meet. Anybody who happens to be in your proximity. Uh, it could even be somebody on video chat. You know, anybody. Speaking unjustly against our neighbor to the prejudice of his reputation. 
when you damage someone else's reputation. Number three, bearing false witness against him upon oath or in common converse or conversation to raise our own reputation above the ruin of our neighbors. Anytime you lift yourself up against somebody else. Did you guys hear, you heard our, our brother Jacob sing today? Jacob Johnson, wasn't he good? He didn't clap for me. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. When you lift yourself up and you don't lift someone else up and you're trying to damage someone else's reputation and make yourself look better than you really are. Anyone who's made a resume has been tempted to do this. I did fantastic things. In fact, I don't know why they fired me. Yeah. The ninth commandment. Thus, the ninth commandment is a strong declaration against covenant breaking and all forms of untruth, including exaggeration, forgive me, understatement, fabrication, or the willful giving of an explanation not supported by the facts, even sharing the truth can have the effect of lying when you tell only half-truths that do not give a full picture. We can also be guilty of bearing false witness and lying if we say nothing, particularly if we allow another to reach a wrong conclusion while we hold back information that would have led to more accurate perception. In this case, it is as though an actual lie were uttered. Lying and misrepresentation in all their forms are wrong, no matter how they may be rationalized, and those who silently let their evils pass unchallenged are also doing wrong. Allowing a lie to be propagated and believed by someone when you know otherwise. You are now a partner in a lie. That, that makes it a little pers more personal, right? And do you understand that there is no love in this? In bearing false witness against someone else, in saying something unkind about someone else. There is no love in it at all. And thou shalt not covet. You know, her ice cream's bigger than my ice cream. Sort of coveting. Coveting is a strong desire for something that isn't yours. It's just not. Jealousy is a strong desire to have something that is rightfully yours, but isn't yours right now. Envy is just want. But coveting is actually wanting something specific from somebody else. And it usually comes from comparing. Did you notice that? I pull up to a beautiful new car and I go. And I see a little tear from my car. <laughs> Don't you love me? Yeah, but that's a beautiful car right there. That's brand new. It, it, it doesn't even have dirt on it. Look at you, you're all dirty. Whose fault is that? You know. <laughs> so I need to be appreciative for my car. <laughs> Coveting. Somebody has more than you. It's not, it's not being thankful for what you have and saying, God, thank you for giving it to me. It's saying, what about this guy over here? Well, what do you care? You follow me. You're right, Lord. That's what I'll do. It could be that somebody possesses some quality and attraction or finances or an ability. Somebody might be able to play guitar far better, better than me. Guess what? I want to hear them. I'm waiting for Paul Malis to play. But I, we should appreciate the gifts that God has given to other people instead of coveting and wishing it was all ours. Why do we always need to be the center of everything? We don't. So coveting is one of those things that can get really sour and there's no love in it at all. You can, if you're a single person and you see a married couple who's happy or you see a dating couple who's happy and you go, I hope they rot, you know. It, it happens. People get jealous and you have, to be, you have to be really careful because it's one of the commandments and there's no love in it at all. You're not acting led of the spirit of God. None of that comes from him at all. And it's completely devoid. It's a spirit that you should not be of. So it usually comes from looking over the fence at your neighbor's stuff and saying, hmm, this lawn's better than mine. This lawn's bigger than mine. He pays less taxes than me. 
you know, he's got a pool. A pool. It's going to get warm in a pool. <laughs> Guess what? Don't look at what other people have. And if you see it, praise God for it. Because they wouldn't have it unless the Lord wanted them to have it. And if they're not supposed to have it, you can know that they're not going to have it for long. So it doesn't matter whether it's a car, it's a house, it's a relationship, it's finances, it's an ice cream. Be careful of your heart that it doesn't go in that direction because you're not acting out of love. And the one thing you can boil everything down to is love, right? And there's no love in it at all. Greed is one of those things that's deep in our heart. He who dies with the most toys still dies. I thought that was a good bit of wisdom. I saw the bumper sticker, he who dies with the most toys wins. He who dies with the most toys dies. He dies. And all that stuff will go to somebody else who doesn't appreciate it, and it'll be in a garage sale. And anything else, any other commandment that you might think of that's in the scripture, they're all summed up in the saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And all those commandments were designed to show you that you're not acting in love if you fall into any of those things. And so I want to make sure that I patrol my heart and my mind to make sure I'm not going into any of those categories. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And you remember Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was. And he says, the greatest commandment is that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, that you will love your neighbor as yourself. And he said, all these things, all the law and the prophets hang upon these two. It's interesting. I looked up the word hang. You know what it means? Hang. In the original Greek, it means hang. And why would Jesus say hang? That's rather interesting. Love your neighbor as yourself. I thought this was a clever cartoon that I came upon. There was a guy begging in the street, and he thought a more effective way to be able to get someone to give was to put a mirror in front of him. And so when people looked down at him, they would see themselves. And then perhaps they would have compassion to give. And I think that's what the scripture is saying. We should see ourselves in other people. We should see another soul that God loved and created. And it doesn't matter what their situation or where they are. We should have love for them, which isn't a, oh, it's not a warm and fuzzy. It's not a Hallmark card day. It's a decision for their best. It's a decision to say, I'm going to do what is best for you, whatever that is. So love others. And love others the way you love yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. That kind of boils it down, doesn't it? For me to speak against someone or to neglect somebody, to ignore somebody, for me to intentionally harm somebody, uh, all of those things are not generated out of love and I am not doing what God's asked me to do. And if we're going to call ourselves Christians, we should follow Jesus, the Christ, and betray, uh, or portray rather, his character, which means that we love people. I don't know about you, but when I'm done with my body and they put me in the ground, I would hope that that could be said of me. He loved people. He loved God. I don't care what else is there. Let my wife worry about it. Isn't that what you want? He loved people. He loved God. She loved God. You couldn't want more. And yet, we don't make it the goal of our life. We don't make it the occupation of our hands and uh, the, the, the thing that dictates our schedule. We don't let that pervade, and we should. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us about love, and I have it in the Amplified Version just to give it a little different ring for you. Love, unconditional love, by the way, this is agape love, God's love, that he has for us, that he asks us to demonstrate. Love endures with patience and serenity, which tells you that all along there's this going on inside of you, but you don't act on it. That's what love is. Love is kind. Love is thoughtful. It is not jealous or envious. Love does not brag and is not proud or arrogant. It is not rude. 
It is not self-seeking. It is not provoked or overly sensitive and easily angered. It does not take into account a wrong endured. In other words, it doesn't remember somebody else's fault. They, love, love really pre-forgives. It does not rejoice in injustice, but rejoices with the truth when right and truth prevail. Love bears all things regardless of what comes, believes all things, looking for the best in each one. He hopes all, love hopes all things, remaining steadfast during difficult times and endures all things without weakening. That's what real love is. Love never fails. It never fades or ends. That's what we're called to. In our own humanity, we don't possess the power to do this. But with the Spirit of God inside of us, we do. And you can do it really well and you can get real creative with it. And it's fun to love on other people. At least I think so. True love is an overflow of what we have received from God. Without it, we have nothing authentic to give others. You could put on a performance. You could do something to get thanked or to get recognized. But you don't have anything that's authentic that comes from a root of a, a spiritual background because it's not given to you by God. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you haven't surrendered your life to him and asked God to take char charge of your life, you don't have the power to do this. But if the Lord is in your life, you have the capability to do it. So don't sleep. Love is a gift freely given, willingly and selflessly seeking no reward or response. It's not giving out to get back. It's not, I'll do you a favor, but you owe me one. It's none of that. Love is a commitment to another's greater good. When you have a commitment to every single person that you see and face, we should be saying, what is, it, what is it that this person needs that I can give them? You know, there are some people that need encouragement. There are some people that are really down, depressed. There are some people that are very anxious. There are some people that are just flat out poor. There are people that are prideful. And if I care for them, I'll do my best in love to take them down a notch. That's being committed to someone else's greater good. If, if you're going to step out of line and you're going to start abusing one of these sheep in here, I'll, I'll step in. In love, God help me. And that's what we should do. And that should always be upon our mind because that is the bottom line of what Christ is teaching us. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Jesus was asked in Matthew 22, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God and all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets. After he answered that, we have the commentary in Luke 10, 29. The dude was a lawyer who asked Jesus this question. And of course, he had a, a backup question. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Lawyers always looking for a loophole. And that was the case. So who's my neighbor? And then Jesus tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. He says there was a man who was going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. And they beat him, they beat him down, beat him unconscious, and left him for dead. Stripped off all his clothes, took all his stuff. Laying there naked, bleeding, not sure if he's even alive. A priest, or a Levite first, goes by. Somebody from a privileged tribe of Israel, somebody who's, you know, a privileged person, walks by and walks around and keeps going his way. And secondly, a priest comes by and walks around on the other side and just avoids this guy. And then a common guy from Samaria who people in Samaria had a questionable lineage because it was Jews that mixed with Babylon. And so there was a question as to whether they're really Jews or they're not. So they're mixed breeds. And so they were looked down upon by the Jews. This guy, you know, on his way to work, whistling a happy tune, sees this guy in the street, takes off his own clothes, bandages up his, his wounds, puts him on his own donkey, brings him to a hotel. 
make sure he's comfortable and washed up and taken care of and he has food. And then he pays the innkeeper a couple of talents, which is a couple of days pay, by the way. And he says, listen, if this guy needs anything, take care of him. And when I come back, if there's any other expense, I'll pay it. And Jesus said, which one of these three was a neighbor <laughs> to the one that fell? You see, Jesus turns it around. It's not, well, who's my neighbor? Does it exclude people that don't look like me, talk like me, dress like me, or live near me? No. The question is, who are you going to be a neighbor to? It should be everybody. So that's what Jesus tells us. And it says, upon these two hang all the law and the prophets. We saw love displayed in that God sent his only son perfect in every way and died for us so that we wouldn't go to a place of eternal torment for our rebellion and our genetic malignancies. Love. It's patient. You know what patience is? You're sitting in traffic, but you, you, your foot's tapping. But you're not honking the horn, you're not yelling, you're not rolling the window down, no single finger salutes. That's being patient. There's, there's a tug of war going on. That's love. That's love? That's love. Any of you married? You know what I'm talking about. That's what love is. Our love is therefore the truest measure of our obedience to God. To claim that you know the maker of the universe and that he's changed you and you've been made a new creation, you have a new heart and a new mind, that's all well and good and a great theological statement, but guess what? If it doesn't show in what you do and how you love people, it means nothing. Amen. And do this, meaning love, and do this, knowing the time. And now is high time that we awake out of sleep. Church, this is a word for us. Because, you know, we can be very comfortable in these walls, but there's a, there's a dying world out there. For now, our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. You know, this is, this is a message that we need to hear. We need to wake up because we're just letting a lot of things go. Oh, well, they'll be taking away. You know what? <laughs> People have said, if one reporter from... Uh, NBC said, if Joe Biden wins the election, they should take all the children away from people who supported Trump and put them in a camp and reprogram them. This is stuff that's being said openly. And people are like, yeah. So are we just going to take this lying down? It's all going to burn, boys and girls, and we better get ready because Jesus wants us to wake up and he wants us to take charge of our lives and do something other than let things happen. I remember we just went through the, the period we call Easter, the resurrection, and Jesus asked his disciples to pray with him. And he said, just come with me. He took three, the, 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 the three, I think, special ed characters because uh, they needed heightened supervision. And and he said, pray with me. And so they said they would. And he came back three times and he says, look, you're still sleeping. And then he said, okay. Are you still sleeping? Well, this is enough. The hour's come. Behold, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. My betrayer is at hand. And you know what? That was the end of them having any relationship and conversation and anything with Jesus. And it was marked by failure. I don't want to be one of those where the Lord takes me home and I go, I really meant to, to call so-and-so and I put it off for a couple of years. Wow, I really should have done something about that. Regret is one of those things that's very hard to deal with if you can't repent of it. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Amen? Amen. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Temptation comes about our lives and distraction comes about our lives. And unfortunately, we don't view it as, we, we sometimes think God's failed to protect us and take care of us. 
but he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able, but along with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that we can stand up under it. So these trials and difficulties that come into our life, they're designed to make us stronger and tougher and know how to fight against the machine. And yet, very often, we blame God for those things and say, well, I couldn't help myself. She left the cheesecake out. What am I supposed to do? So I ate it all. For being tempted in that which he himself has suffered, he is able to help those who are being tempted, says in Hebrews 2.18. Jesus is able to help us because he endured temptation yet without sin. And so if you want counsel, Jesus will give you counsel. You need strength, he'll give you counsel. He'll give you strength. You need encouragement, he'll give you encouragement. The thing is, we tend to want to do what we want to do and we don't go there. So what should I do if I'm being tempted into sin? Take a look at that picture, if you will. It's a beautiful shiny red apple with a worm coming out of it. Would it be that we saw temptation so clearly? Don't you want to take a bite of this beautiful juicy apple? Well, it's juicy because there's a big giant worm crawling out of it, okay? And if we were able to see the ultimate end of us falling into temptation, I have a feeling we would say no to a whole lot more than we do. And he says here, therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness. He's talking about taking off, almost like clothing. Clothing that's not going to do you any good and you shouldn't have it on anyway because it's on fire. Take it off. We are told to stop certain things and put them off. By the power of God, we can And you may think, you know, there are things in my life, Pastor Dave, that you don't even know. And you know what? I would agree with you. You're right. But you know what? There's things in my life that you don't even know. But I can tell you, I've got a whole lot more stuff behind me now that God has helped me to deal with than I do in front of me. And it's the power of God that helps us to do that. So we say no to those things that we know are bad. I mean, you may know somebody or you may even be this person who is in a relationship. And you know it's toxic. It's wrong. I shouldn't be here. But... You know, we're still together. So you plan on getting married? Oh, God, no. <laughs> really? Yeah, but you know, better than nothing. There are people that accept that form of life. Like that's God's plan for them? Loving somebody means telling them the truth. And in their best interest, tell them, you know what? You're wasting your life. Cut it out. Mr. Okay for today is not enough. You want Mr. Perfect, you're going to have to be available. (laughs) And you're never available if you're with Mr. Okay for today. Anyway, just a thought. So don't go there. No matter how tricky you think you are, and you're going to be able to get away with something, you won't. So just don't go there. And it says, put on the armor of light. Putting on the armor of light. I I love that poetic way of saying it. You put on the armor of light. You know what it is when you're walking in the spirit and you're just right with God and everything is good? More of you should know. It's awesome. It's awesome to be right in the middle of God's will doing exactly what God wants you to do and you don't care if he takes you home tomorrow. You're doing exactly what he wants you to do and there's no regrets. That's what it is to put on the armor of light. Because you know what? You're shielded and you're insulated from a bunch of junk. You fall into some stupid thing and it's almost like you stepped in a mud puddle and splashed yourself and you're like, ew. And it takes a while, doesn't it? Because you got to get cleaned up. You got to overcome your conscience. You have to do some wrestling. You got to get on your knees. There's tears. And I don't know about you, but I have to go through like a whole process. And God already loves me and forgives me. But I have a problem with me. Having the armor of light on means, I remember I went to Las Vegas and I had a number of girls come up to me because apparently prostitution is legal. And a middle-aged man walking down the strip apparently is a target. I I wasn't thinking. And there are girls coming up to me saying, hey, you want a party? No, not particularly, but thank you for asking. Have a good day. (laughs) By the way, here's a track, you know. 
You, you have the armor of light on you. There's, no, there's just no way. When you're walking in the spirit and you're in fellowship with God and he's talking to you and you're talking to him and you're just doing everything that's right and temptation comes, you're like, you, you, you may as well have a giant mole on your face and you may as well be the ugliest, most hideous person on the face of the planet because that's what that says to me because I am not going to fall for that junk when I'm walking in the spirit. But you know, if I'm in a selfish sort of mode and I think God's forgotten about me and I'm on my own, you're a target. You're a target and sin will find you. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. You'll notice there's three couplets there. The first two, you probably use revelry all the time in your conversation, don't you? Well, it's quite a day of revelry last night. You know, revelry is a nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who, after supper, parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus, because they've been drinking, or some other deity, and they sing and play before houses of male and female friends, hence use generally of feasts and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. Revelry, revelry is doing whatever the heck I want. That's what revelry is. Shut up. Get out of my way. I'm going to do whatever I want. That's revelry. Now, I know none of you have ever... Never mind. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, that's somebody that always wants a fight, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, there's revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If that's your lifestyle, don't think that you're going to get a happy welcome when you die. It's just not going to happen. Walking properly, not in lewdness or lust. Lewdness speaks of bedding down or conceiving or causing conception or chambering. We call it sleeping around. Don't do that. It's funny, Romans was written to a bunch of Christians and he's telling Christians not to do this. Really? No bedding, conceiving, no chambering, no sleeping around because it, it will come to bite you, won't it? I was engaged once. You guys want to ask me whether I was good or not? No, I'm sorry I brought it up. You know what happens when you violate that barrier that God created just for a man and a woman to share? You both never trust each other again. Because if you're willing to do that with me before we're married, maybe you're willing to do that with anybody. Because I am not the best specimen of a human being on the face of the planet. And I will never be trusted again. Where are you going? Who are you with? When are you coming back? Whoa, baby, what's up? You're like all over me. You don't trust me? Well, I, I'll miss you. No, you don't trust me. That's what happens. You violate trust. And that's the foundation that a relationship rests on, by the way. And without trust, it's just a matter of time. Lust, unbridled lust, excess, licentiousness, lasciviousness. These are, these are good vocabulary words. Wantonness, outrageousness, shamelessness, insolence. That's what lust is. It's just, it's always having desire. And by the way, those feelings grow, right? You ever find a favorite restaurant and you go, oh, best restaurant. Love this restaurant. Where are you eating today? At my favorite restaurant. Well, aren't you sick of it? No, it's my favorite restaurant. I go there all the time. It's an, it's an amazing thing how feelings can get generated. And you have the ability to allow them to grow and flower like poison ivy which will eventually take you over and make you very sorry, or you keep them in check. I'm preaching to myself, I'm on a diet. Or strife and envy. Strife is debate, contention, and variance, which means somebody says, uh, it's hot in here, and you go, no, it isn't. You know, there's people that always say the opposite of whatever you're saying. Isn't that a beautiful red? No, that's burgundy. 
All right, I thought it was in the red family. No, Burgundy. Actually, it's more of a Chianti. Okay, whatever. Strife, debate, contention. Be careful that your heart doesn't do that because you're not walking in love if you do it. 2 Timothy 2, 24 and 26 says, and the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. So any of you who are on Facebook, <laughs> you got it all wrong, man. I just got to play. Huh, send, there, take that. Oh, yeah, well, you, oh, my goodness, three hours have passed. This person still hasn't changed their mind. Give it up. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel. By the way, that's, that's our same word there, strife, debate, contention. Don't do it. But be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Notice, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Because if you're going to fight with somebody, they'll never listen to you. If you don't do it in love, then they don't give a rip what you say. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive to do his will. So don't be a fighter. Don't be contentious. Don't be picking fights with everybody. You know, Pastor, you said something today I don't agree with. Oh, okay. You got a chapter and verse. I'd be glad to learn. Well, it's more my opinion. I said, okay, I'll put it on that shelf. I'll put it on the shelf of, that's my opinion. If it's the scripture, I'm going to do it. If it's your opinion, I'll just put it on the shelf that's labeled other people's opinions. I would hope you all do that. So put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds very bizarre, but you guys know what it means. It means to think, to do, to act, to walk, to have your conversation all about the things of Jesus Christ. That's how you put on Jesus Christ, with his character. And make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. First of all, put on Christ. The fruit of the Spirit, what it is that happens in our life as a result of God coming and making a change, and we accept God's gift of forgiveness through Jesus Christ, and we accept it, and we say, okay, I give you my life, take it. I messed it up bad enough, it's all yours. When that happens, God comes into your life. He comes into your heart. He remakes your brain in your heart in the spiritual sense, and you change. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. And you begin to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. That's what comes out of your life and an evidence that God's in your life. It's not stuff you do to make yourself right to go to heaven. It's stuff that comes out of your life because you are right and you're going to heaven. Amen? Amen. The fruit of the Spirit is love, first thing. Unconditional, agape love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, which means you do the, the right thing all the time, gentleness, which means you're concerned with offending other people, self-control. There's a big one. Against such things there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh and its passions and desires. And if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. By the way, that was a letter to the church, not to a bunch of unbelievers. And so if we're not careful, that could happen with us, couldn't it? Mark 9.43 says, Jesus said, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. For it's better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands and go to hell into the fire that shall never be quenched. It's a very good point, isn't it? It says, no make don't make a provision for the flesh. A provision for the flesh would be, well, listen, I got a porn problem, but I don't mind staying up to three o'clock in the morning and watching TV. I got news for you. You know what's on TV late at night? Bunch of junk. Just stay off it. You don't need to go look to prove me wrong. Trust me, it's a bunch of junk. You don't need to be on it. For me to stay up late, you know what happens? I begin to get weak. 
physically, mentally, spiritually. If I'm not sharpening the sword and if I'm not in the spirit, I'm getting weak. When I'm hungry and I haven't eaten, I can get hangry. Any of you know what that means? I think that's why in John chapter 21, Jesus fed Peter before he went and told him, hey, listen, you, you, you say you love me? Feed my sheep. You say you love me? You know, feed my sheep. You love me? Feed. Before he spoke a word to Peter, he made sure that he ate, which is a good, it's a good thing to eat before you come to church because you tend to listen better. Did you notice that? I haven't eaten. It helps me to a faster. Make no provision for the flesh. Guys, don't get yourself into an opportunity where you're going to be tempted. Don't think that you're so strong that you can't fall. Don't think that you got it all together and, oh, everything's going so good in my life. Eh, what could happen? I'll give you a few pages of what could happen. I'll show you lives of people who ruined their lives because they thought, well, what could happen? Last slide, guys. Chapter 13, verse 8. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time that now is high time to awake out of your sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent and the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. 